management account, would that be an LLC or just a DBA or does it have to be anything like that? It, yeah, you can just do it as a DBA. Okay. So uh, I, have a, a plan. I personally, I have a, a, a sub-chapter S corporation as my property manager because I figure if, you know, the tenants can sue somebody, they're going to sue the property management company first. And so I want it to be a corporation, so I get some asset protection there, and there are no assets in that corporation. I guess if you already had a property management company, because you had multiple properties around, that, that, some were, that would work. work perfect. Okay. Yes, sir. So let's say, for instance, um, you know, you have some properties, and you might be getting sued or something like that. Um, even if they had, like, an idea that you have these land trusts and stuff, they really wouldn't be able to do anything about it, it sounds like because it's just the, like the way it's managed. Like they wouldn't have any lead to well, you know, I'm, do I'm anything you brought with it. that up because using a, a land trust to hold title of these properties puts you in a whole different light with your tenants. You know, tenants are smart. They get online to see who owns property. You get a good real life story. In fact, uh, we've got five really real life stories in Linda's latest publication. This is an article I wrote for Linda's publication. It says, five stories to convince you to use a land trust. But one of those stories is, a, I've got a, a, a group of 10 condominiums on a corner in, in my town. And a couple of summers ago, the police were being called. Like every Friday night, the police were there and there was trouble. So when I investigated, I found out there was one woman who was at the heart of all the problems. Every time there was a blow up, she was always at the center of it. So I decided not to renew her lease. Her lease came up for renewal. I said, we're not going to renew it. Well, why not? I said, because the owner told me not to. The owner thinks you're a troublemaker, and the owner told me not to renew it. <laughs> That's a little different than me saying, you're a troublemaker. I'm calling you a troublemaker. You see what I mean? You get that third party separation. Well, she was hot, hot as a hornet. She was really mad, but she realized there wasn't anywhere to go with me because I'm just the property manager. You know, I just take my job like everybody else. I can't wait to go home, <laughs> get a coffee break, you know, just leave me alone. I'm just a property manager. So three days later, I get a call from my attorney's secretary. She says, hey, there's this woman in our lobby, raising hell, wants, wants to speak to my boss, my attorney, about her lease. Well, what did she done? She'd gone online, looked up who owned her condo, which was my attorney, who was serving in that case as my trustee. She marched on down, because he's in the phone book. I'm not, but he's in the phone book. He, she marched on down to his office and wants to talk to him, confront him. I was once a new lease. She said, what do you want me to do? I said, throw her out. If she won't leave voluntarily, call the cops. She has no right to be there. But that is a prime example of just how far people will go. And it's all based on what you record at the courthouse. Anybody ever heard of LexisNexis? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Attorneys hire them all the time to find your assets, to decide whether they're going to sue you or not. Where do they get the information? 98% of it comes from the courthouse. So stop signing things that are going to get recorded at the courthouse. That's the moral of that story. Yes, sir. So the trustee would usually be an attorney, or what would, could it, uh, would that be the optimum person to be the trustee? Um, no, not necessarily. Um, in my home study course, I've got a course guide. Uh, I have a whole chapter in here on who should be your trustee. Your trustee could be a friend, an attorney, your accountant, could be a professional trustee. The Chicago Title has a professional trustee service, and a lot of them. Companies have professional trustee services, but they'll charge. I like people that don't charge. I like people that have a different last name than me, who live out of state, and that, that I trust. And you know, some people can, you can find them, and some you can't. Let's listen just a minute to this young man. Uh, this guy's name is Wesley Roman, and he took my home study course. I do a live event a couple times a year. Um, and he, he went to a live seminar to see if it works. Here we go. No okay. And uh, several years ago, I took Randy's course. It was um, 
extremely helpful. Randy is definitely the master when it comes to asset privacy protection. I was really blown away. And the reason why I wanted to take it is, um, one, because of accumulating some known properties, and um, two, because my business partner um, has some personal assets that we wanted to keep separate and uh, keep them protected. So this has been a huge help for that. And Randy's forms in the book, um, the instructions in the book, lay everything out, made it really simple to execute, and uh, didn't have any problems. It's all there. So I would highly recommend his course, and uh, I would recommend it to anyone. Thank you. Can I ask yes. A if you put a property in a land trust uh -huh. and then you sell it, are you still liable? If you sign on the debt, yes. Now, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, there are ways of selling. Uh, one way is all cash, right? So if you sell for all cash, you're probably going to deed out of the trust to the buyer. So if you pay off your loan, you're not liable. But I like to sell on a contract. Does anybody ever sell on a contract where you, where you take a down payment and they make payments to you and you make payments to your bank? Mm -hmm. That's a great way to sell. I mean, think about it. I've been in this business since 1969. Some houses I've had for 30, 35 years. They have, they've depreciated down to zero. They have no debt. And if I sell them for all cash, I'm going to get killed, all right, tax-wise. <coughs> But if I sell conventionally, if I go to you and say, okay, you give me 20 grand, I'll sell you this $150,000 house, and I'll take back a note for 130,000, 20 down, 130, you make payments to me. That's a pretty good deal for me because I can charge 7%, at least in my town I can charge 7%. I think that's fair. If you can't qualify for a lower uh, rate on your mortgage, that's not my, my fault. But if I'm gonna be the bank, I'm gonna charge you a little bit higher rate. You guys understand how that works. So I'm getting seven percent on 130 grand. Where can I get seven percent on anything anymore? What the bank? One percent? If I'm lucky, two percent? If you go long term? So seven percent is a great return. What's the problem? The problem is, what if you default on the loan? Then I got to foreclose. I don't want to foreclose. You don't have to foreclose. Is anybody in here ever foreclose on somebody? It's not a lot of fun. It takes a year in my town and $8,000 in legal fees. And if I've got an underlying loan, I, I have the pleasure of paying those monthly payments while you're living in my house for free while I'm foreclosing on you. So I protect my credit score. I would make those payments. So that's the problem with selling on a contract. How do we solve the problem? In trust, the land trust. Put the property in a land trust. I sell the beneficial interest in the trust to you on an installment contract basis. Same structure, but the beneficial interest in a land trust is personal property. Remember, the trustee owns the real estate, full legal and equitable title. You own the beneficial interest. The beneficial interest is personal property, just like this. This is personal property. Isn't it? This I sell on an installment contract basis. Why? Because if you default when you're buying personal property, well, let's take an example. Anybody in here finance the truck or car lately? Who holds title? Do you have a title? The bank. The bank holds the title because they paid for it, right? And they're going to hold that title until what? The very last payment is made. What happens if you don't make the last payment? You make all four, four years and 11 months worth of payments, and you default on the last payment. What happens? They, they come and repossess it, right? <laughs> right out of your driveway. That's exactly what happens with a land trust beneficial interest. And that's why I sell the beneficial interest on an installment contract, because if you default, I repossess, I do not foreclose. That takes me 30 to 45 days and not much in legal fees. Is that cool or what? That concept alone was worth you coming today. Yeah. Just that one, if you don't take anything else away today, remember that. Yes, when they're on that land contract with you, there's no way for them to go to the county and try to record something in their name as no. ownership. No, it's not recorded. It says right in the contract, you will not record this contract. Yes, sir.
Oh, well, she, she was first. Um, how does that work with the, the last question, uh, with the lien? Say you have a contract coming out and does a roof and, uh, he wants to put a lien on the property with it being in the last How does that work? Yeah, he could still do it. I mean, um, when you put your property in a land trust, liens and judgments against the beneficiary do not attach to the property in the trust. Another big reason for using it. A lot of people in this last downturn, there are a lot of good people, especially in California and Florida, who got hit hard financially. And they have liens and judgments, deficiency judgments, foreclosure issues. They can't get back in the real estate game. Because if they buy anything in their name, that lien and judgment will immediately attach to anything they buy. Not these land trusts. Because liens and judgments do not attach to the property held in land trust. Now, if you put your property in a land trust and you go out and get a new roof put in your house and don't pay the roofer, he can put a lien against the house. That's a different story. I'm talking about liens and judgments against you personally as a beneficiary of a land trust. All right, let me move on here a minute and then we'll get back to the question. I thought this was interesting. I ran into this list of people most likely to get sued in America today. <laughs> you may find yourself on there more than once, but... This is the reason why I use a land trust tax. If all my home study course did was prevent you from sitting across the table from these guys, <laughs> would it be worth it? Yes. <laughs> if it saved you from one lawsuit, would it be worth it? If, you, if you've been involved in a lawsuit, you realize just how expensive and stressful it is. It's no fun at all. So. I put together a land trust made simple system. And I'm going to give you the four steps to creating a land trust right now. So, the first thing you do is try to get the clicker to catch up. There we go. You create the trust agreement. Remember we talked about the trust agreement being a contract? So you do that. You get that form from me. You create the deed in trust. So the trust agreement is, think of this building as the trust agreement. Again, the, the builders of this building had to build the building first before they could put the furniture in it, right? So the trust agreement is the building and the real estate is the furniture in that example. So you gotta have the trust agreement first before you deed in the property. You record the deed and then step four is my favorite step. You sleep better at night. And I'm really not kidding. You do sleep a lot better at night. I mean, just imagine for all you folks with a couple million bucks of real estate in your name right now, going home tonight, putting your head on the pillow without that thought. It's not in my name anymore. Then they just kind of free you and relax you. It doesn't mean yes, name. What can you do for lazy procrastinators like me who say, Randy, I love this stuff, but I haven't got your books. It's been sitting in my office for three years. Can I just pay you for some help? Is there anything there you can say on that? Well, I, I really can't. I mean, to prepare a deed or any legal document for somebody else, you have to be a licensed lawyer in the state where you're That's practicing. Right. But you can create your own contracts and your own deeds all you want and not be a lawyer. So at some point, you do have to take personal action, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Smile me a few more times, please. I need it. I heard you say earlier that you own property in Illinois, but you don't have your trust created in that state. Right. So why is that? Uh, why are you suggesting that? Well, number one, I, right? yes, number one, I don't like Illinois land trust law. Uh, as I said, there's no federal land trust law. It's all state by state. Some states are better than others, in my opinion. I like Virginia trust law, for example. So if I lived in California, I'd probably form a Virginia land trust to hold title to my California property. And I explain it more in the book. We don't really have time to go into the details of that, but there are some tremendous asset protection benefits to owning property in an out-of-state entity. A lot, a, a lot. Okay, so let me get into the specifics here a little bit more. Step one, you start with a good trust agreement. And it does have to have special uh, provisions in it. You follow my instructions. I give you instructions in the trust agreement. You know, if this, then that. You print. 
your trustee signs it and you sign it if you're the beneficiary. And you keep your records only. The trust agreement is not recorded anywhere on the planet. Now, how many other entities fall into the category of not being registered anywhere on the planet? None. Only trust. So, another good reason not to title the property in corporations and LLCs, because they are recorded, aren't they? Aren't they registered, I mean? Don't you pay a registration fee? Part of the reason for that registration fee is so you can have a registered agent. Why do you need a registered agent? For process of service. If somebody wants to sue your corporation, they don't have to find you. All they got to do is go to your registered agent and serve him, and you are served. Because you know what? A lawsuit doesn't start until somebody's served. To, sur to sue a trust, to sue a land trust, you have to serve the trustee. What if my trustee was out of state? You suppose somebody in California would want to hire somebody in Virginia to go find that trustee who's got, only got a P.O. box and only comes to the box once a year? It's going to be a little expensive to hang around that P.O. box for a year waiting for that guy to show up. And now you see what I'm talking about? Now, let's take it a step further. I've had nine trustees die in the last 35 years of using this trust. The first time a trustee died, I panicked and I thought, oh my God, I'm going to lose my property. He's dead. What's going to happen? And so I just kind of sat back and waited to see what would happen. And I found out that there's no dead trustee release anywhere. <laughs> because nothing happened. And it occurred to me about a year after the event that why did I need a live trustee? Why does anybody need a live trustee? Well, there are two answers. One, you're financing and you need him to sign the mortgage. Because he's the full legal and equitable title holder, right? So he's got to sign the mortgage. Or two, I'm selling. I'm going to sell the property out of the trust. I need him to sign the deed because he owns the property, right? If I'm not doing one of those two things, why do I need a live trustee? I don't. So I just left it in his name. It was probably 15 years later that I sold the property. What happened? I designated a new trustee the day, today. I go to the title company tomorrow and said, my trustee died. Here's my new one. Okay. Let's close this one. Can you see the advantage of that? To serve a trust, to, to sue a trust, you need to serve the trustee. What if your trustee is six foot under? In some respects, you're right. Dead trustee is better than life. Now we're just, you know, we're getting into the tip of the iceberg here, guys. This is really, really cool stuff. I, I can't impress upon you how cool this stuff is. Um, let's go on here. Our step two is to create the deed. Where you start with a deed, template. All guys have seen the deed. It does have to have a special provision in it, like I mentioned earlier. The seller is the grantor, because the right way to do this is to buy directly from the seller. Have the seller deed from himself to your trust, and you stay out of the chain of title forever. That's the best way to do it. But it's already in your name, it's still to your advantage to deed out of your name now to your trust. Your trustee is a grantee. We're talking about the deed. So grantor is the seller, trustee receiving the deed is the grantee. Then you trot on down to the county recorder's office and you record that deed and trust in the county where the property is located. Not where you're located, not where uh, your trustee is located, not where the trust is formed. You don't go to Virginia. You record it in the county where the property is located. Then they either mail it back to you or they stamp it right then and give it to you, right? And then you put that in your file and you're good to go for step number Yes, ma'am. And you don't physically have to go to the county court. You can do it all <clears throat> through the mail. Yeah. yeah. Excuse me. Yes. You said that the property in the land trust and the protective privacy. 
Right? When you run chain of title, you will see everybody there. And you run one, two, three, you see I'm the owner of the property on the LLC. On the LLC? Yeah. Or the corporation or whatever. Um, you, are you talking about if the corporation or the LLC holds title? No. I, have, I own the property in LLC now. It's in an LLC now. I'm going to listen to you. Okay, you transfer it out of the LLC to the land trust. Right. right. But when he is going to check the title, the recorded items, see the okay. property is a land trust. But chain of title shows, bottom line, how is the owner of the property? Right. Have and you ever, has, have you, wait, let me just ask you, have you ever owned property before that you don't own now? Has anybody ever yes. owned a piece of real yes. estate that they yes. don't own now? Yes. yes. So, can I go down to the courthouse and look and see that one at one point in time you owned it? That doesn't mean you own it anymore, does it? You transfer a title out to a trust that does not have your name on it. You don't own it anymore. I don't own it anymore. It's been transferred out. The public doesn't know if the trustee of that trust is my trustee or your trustee. So you're making an assumption that they that everybody knows that you transferred out of your LLC to a trust that you're the beneficiary of, but there's no way to prove that. But when you do a deed of trust, right, that it was transferred from my LLC to that deed of trust. <laughs> to, to a trustee, right. To a trustee. And they see the signature. From the LLC, yeah. They transferred it out of their name. Just like you sold a piece of real estate from, from you to me. You see, there's no difference going on there. The, the tr title is transferred. <clears throat> It's transferred out of you or your LLC's name, and now it's in a trust. And nobody knows who the beneficiary of the trust is. It could be me, it could be you, it could be her. So, um, I'm just going to make things uh, more clear with myself. If, if you don't, I'm so in the process of opening a corporation. Um, in fact, I was just talking to Dan this morning about it. So if you don't have that set up already, it's not good to go from your name into the, the deed and trust. It's better to go into like a... Nevada Corporation and transfer the Nevada to the deed of trust. No, what I'm saying is any property that's in your name now, mm -hmm. you should transfer out of your name into a trust. Because okay. nobody knows who the beneficiary of that trust is. In the future, anything you buy, take title directly from the seller mm -hmm. to your trust. Don't take it in your name and then go to the trust because then you've been entitled one day. Uh -huh. you, you're better off in life not being in the chain of title ever on a piece of real estate. There's no benefit, uh, only negatives. I mean, get fine. I never thought that you'd go to us. How do you can get financing? I know they didn't trust something that's allowed. Yeah. They allowed it uh, land trust? Uh, he's asking that how can you finance property you, when you're using a land trust? And the, the answer is, depends on what kind of a loan you're getting. If it is a loan that has to qualify in the secondary market under those guidelines, most of the time the answer is no, they will not let you close directly into the trust. You gotta close in your name and then deed out the next day. But you can only get how many of those? Four? Some lenders up to 10, but Bank of America, for example, once you've got four loans that are uh, qualified in the secondary market, you're out of business. Or you go to a different lender, what I call a portfolio lender, someone who's gonna keep the loan in-house and you, you carry on. I mean, hopefully you're gonna buy more than four pieces of real estate. So once you deal with a portfolio lender, yes, you can close directly into the trust. They're not they're not following those guidelines. Yes, sir. So issues of due on sale is that an issue? Uh, due on sale is not a big issue. Um, depends on if it's your personal residence or a, an investment property. If it's your personal residence, there was a law passed in 1982 called the Garden Saint Germain Act, which says every American has the right to put their property in the land trust and not trigger the due on sale. If it's an investment property, technically, yes, it can trigger the due on sale. No, but from a practical standpoint, it doesn't because the lender doesn't even know that you've transferred it. As long as you keep making your payments, it's generally not a problem in life, no matter what you do. I've noticed that. Yes? Well, it sounds like uh, an LLC might be good for business, but you don't really get an LLC for a property because you could avoid the LLC altogether and just go directly into a land trust. Well, not really. No. Most most real estate investors are going to make the beneficiary of their land trust an LLC or a corporation. But if you want to separate your assets so one's not infected by another, 
and you don't use a land trust, now you're going to be forming LLCs. At 800 bucks a crack, how many do you want? Land trusts cost, cost nothing. So you can separate each one. Keep all your eggs in separate baskets, guys. So they're not uh, cross, cross uh, infecting each other. Let me run through these benefits here. Uh, we talked about probate. We talked about judgments not attaching. Easier management. If you have multiple owners, it's a lot easier to manage real estate in a land trust if you have several owners and they can't agree you can, you can make it work. Wholesaling contract assignments. I know you guys talked about that earlier in the meeting. It's much easier with a land trust. Much easier. Does anybody have any uh, 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 seasoning problems? You ever have a seasoning problem on a deed? You, you already got a buyer and you can't transfer the title for 90 days? Yeah. It, well, if you take title and land trust, it solves that problem. If you transfer the beneficial interest in the trust, and the title remains in the name of the trustee, so you're not uh, affected by that seasoning issue. Let's say you find a killer deal. You go out this afternoon, you find this apartment building, you negotiate a killer deal. There's 50 grand of equity in there, but it's going to take six months to get the deal done. You need 10 grand tomorrow. So you go to Dan and say, Dan, I got 50 grand in equity here. Dan looks at it and says, yeah, there's really 50 grand in equity. You say, Dan, give me 10 grand. I'll assign the beneficial interest in my trust to you, and you complete the deal in six months. Dan will do that all day long. He'll trade 10 for 40 all day long. And the easiest way to do that is with one simple piece of paper. It's called an assignment of beneficial interest. It comes in my forms section. And I'll just point out to you that in my home study course here, it comes with uh, a CD of all the forms you need. It comes with a DVD of the seminar that I'm teaching, which you guys all got a flyer today. This is my next live event is in Studio City on February 28th. If you can't make it, I got it recorded on a DVD. And the audio of that seminar is also in here, so you can listen to it in your car. But all the forms you need are in there uh, for you to complete this kind of uh, transaction. No registered agent. We talked about that, right? No tax return. Anybody doing uh, options, lease options? Works really, really well with options and lease options. Uh, protection against unhappy tenants. <clears throat> we talked about the story of the lady earlier. Um, another real life story, I had a lady call me about a year ago now from Florida. She's a lady landlord. She has, I think, seven uh, investment properties in Florida and her own personal residence. She said, Randy, I gotta get your home study course fast. What's the fastest I can get? I said, oh. I said, what's the hurry? I guess a download version would be pretty quick. Uh, she said, well, I have seven rental properties, and one of my tenants is a guy who's interested in me, and I'm not interested in him. And I just had one of my female tenants at one of my houses call me and say he came by looking for me. So what's he doing? He's looking her up the county records, seeing what she owns, and going house to house looking for her, her personal residence. Is that scary? Yes. Reason number 54, <laughs> <laughs> which never occurred to me because lately I haven't had a whole lot of women stalking me. <laughs> lately, lately. It's been probably 30, 40 years. Uh, and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, what a great reason to use a land trust for personal privacy. So we can't do that. I mean, it's just, it, it's just amazing what happens in the world here. We talked about the due on sale. It, owning this stuff in trust actually helps prevent ID theft. Why? Because if, if you're not in the courthouse records, you know, the ID thieves are really good now. They can get online, go to the courthouse records, and zip, they got your signature off the deed. Zip, they know where you live because it's on the mortgage. Now they got your address and your signature. What else do they need? 
just raise your hand in a picture and it'll get your fingerprints. <laughs> yeah. So just stay out of the courthouse. It just doesn't do you any better. Yes, sir. When was your next uh, your next uh, 